Hi everyone, welcome to our series of um, drought case studies across the Northwest region. Today I'm here with Laurie and John Chaffee um, from the Summerton area. My name's Kate McCarthy and I'm a Northwest Local Land Services Livestock Officer, which I should have said. But yeah, here with Laurie and, and um, John and we're just talking about some of the strategies that they implemented um, over the drought um, and some of the things that I guess some of the lessons that they've picked up and and what they'll they'll utilize moving forward even in a good season so Laurie and Chaffee own a mixed farming enterprise um, they run sheep cattle and have cropping they have 2,700 hectares of um, yeah mixed farming country beautiful at the moment and yeah we re- found it really um, valuable having a chat to them about some of the things they've picked up and and learned and I guess what we pulled out of having the discussion was that they really have an emphasis on preparedness and planning. Um, you know, implementing those plans, but p- taking the time to, to put them in place. John, I'm going to ask you about. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about some of the things around feed base, some of the strategies that you've just mentioned to me earlier about what you um, implemented from a storage, um, both hay and grain, and, and some of those things. So, if you want to touch on that. Yeah. So, over a number of years of farming and cropping and sort of thing, and livestock stuff we've been worked out that our strategy re- involves trying to have a certain amount of feed on hand whether and that will be hay and grain to keep our production system going through at least two seasons and possibly more if we can and so in going into this drought we actually had quite a bit of grain stored on farm some still in the grain corp system and some hay as well and so we we tend to use those things. We we bought in cotton seed at various stages, uh, depending on what our feed base was. We also actually have a fair bit of Kurrajung country, and we utilise that probably not by itself, but always put um, either cotton seed or grain or something with the Kurrajung, which we generally use just for cattle as well. Uh, so we sort of we'll do up our our plans on how much feed we think we're going to need. To get through to a certain point so and our key points are carving weaning joining and those sort of things and so we'll do a bit of a plan as to what we do we'll try and have enough grain to and hay on hand to do at least like i've said six to twelve months at a time uh other issues what yeah. have i missed what have i missed no, I think when we were talking about before, something I found interesting was with the storage side of things. Like you guys talked about, like you, you obviously um, had hay, uh, sorry, uh, silage, was it silage? Grain. Grain, grain stored 20 years. Yeah. Um, but one of the challenges, oh, I'll let you talk yeah. about the challenges Yeah, so that was there. right. Yeah. So we put some years ago, we had a surplus of oats. So we dug pits, put it in the ground. Um, and this time we got to dig it out, which all created new challenges for us into how to handle it and getting it out but um but that grain was as, still as good as the day we put it in there still had as much rye grass in it as when we put it in <laughs> no weevils or anything uh, a bit of weather contamination around the edges but yeah we needed to learn how to remove that grain um we've since actually acquired a grain vac or the family has acquired a grain vac which will help us do that again and we'll be prepared to bury grain again yep. if we need to yep. so, and that'll become a, a, a strategy for us yep. to deal with it yep. yeah and just one one more thing is that we're talking about uh, the hay side of things and I said oh you know with, with your hay storage you like to have your hay sheds full and you go oh well not at the moment but it's one of the things that you really yeah. strive for yeah yeah, yeah no we'll plan to hopefully we've got paddock put aside of oats now this year we'll make into hay We'll probably bale some straw behind the harvester header as well to just have some roughage to go with rations and things. So, yep. yeah. No, excellent. Thanks, John. Um, and now, yeah, we'll talk to Laurie about one of her passions, I guess, cows. Um, we, when we were talking about our case study, we broke it up into certain components, like a bit of a whole farm thing. So touch on the feed base, but yeah, obviously step into the animal side of things. So, so Laurie, what, what were some of the strategies around, you know, your cattle enterprise that you implemented and, and what you like the lessons that you've pulled out of that? Thanks Kate. Um, We started probably with too many cows, um, something that we said after a previous drought we wouldn't do but circumstances meant we had um, more than we wanted. 
we again assess depending on the cycle they were at, whether they were pre-joining, whether they were calving, whether they were weaning, at what management we would do with our cows. Um, we always try to balance that up with what we anticipated would be the feed. We don't really like feeding cows full, you know, full we'd rather um, balance that up. So we did some budgets early out and then we decided with the help of our vet um, as to any cows that we're not going to carve within a six week window yep. and we sold them. That was very traumatic, mm. very sad, but it has had positive spin-offs. Yep. Um, we carved those out when we started through the drought. We also have a um, fattening mob like our weaners that go through. We keep our heifers and then we usually fatten our steers. Um, we then started to target uh, feedlots yep. like for our steers instead of finishing them. Again, doing the budgets, what it was worth to fatten them. What We had the feed and that, but we didn't really have the manpower like to do it. We yep. had the resources except for the manpower. And when we did the budgets, it was easier to just to sell them yep. at that point in time. Um, with our heifers, um, we feed for production so yep. we wanted to feed so they had enough weights to join but um, we sold them we decided to sell them so that we could focus on our um, cows yep. and our production again yep. keeping production in mind getting help along the way is really beneficial yep. um, so we did do some LLS workshops which yep. with was really helpful reading the the drought strategy bibles, yep. um, looking up information, talking to people, um, getting all that support is really, really helpful. Yep. Um, early wean, yep. so um, early wean is pretty um, heart wrenching for some of us, but yep. um, we our youngest weaning weight was probably around about 160, so it's not as, mm. as light as what some other people do. Uh, and then we just managed them instead of um, yeah, just making sure we matched up their nutrition. Yep. One of the things we, well, we did, but we shouldn't have done it, was we didn't mark mm. um, the bull calves as, until too, a bit too late. Yep. So, again, if we had our time again in the future, we would actually use probably rings and maybe settle them down and then um, use rings and, and mark them. Definitely yep. not leave the the marking till as late as what we did yeah and uh and again feed for production yep. try and aim for where you're going yep. have a plan uh where you want to go reassessing your cows focus on your cow weight condition um making sure that they're in that you know increase it to to be able to join so our joining percentages are pretty high yep. um and then anything that doesn't carry their weight so they got to have a calf, got to get back in calf. If they don't, they get to go. Yep. Um, yeah, I think that's probably yeah. pretty much how it all goes together, Kate. Yeah, we, like, yeah, again, when we were having a talk about this, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the decisions that you guys made was that you, you know, at that point in time you said when, you know, when it came to looking at tightening your calving, you seen an opportunity there and you acted on it mm. um, and that followed through each and as you might see like you guys are listening a recurring theme is planning and being you know thinking you know reassessing that plan every mm. every couple of months so that was the plan tighten carving and that's mm. followed through to weaning and the plans that you made around weaning yep. early weaning the nutrition strategy in in the cows and yep. and you said you've like yeah the calves the mob of calves that you you early weaned are doing really well now so yeah yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. yeah. so that's um it's definitely it's really interesting to see from that side of things john back to you <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, from the sheep side of things a, a few key points uh I, I guess one thing that we haven't probably seen it is that we tend to do things uh in steps in so instead of doing everything in one go we sort of like we cut out a cow numbers back slowly from the sheep side of things we we chose to keep our core breeding herd breeding flock to where it was normally and then sold our weathers off or sold our lambs off or fattened our lambs we actually confined lambed one year um we've we'd try and keep we had we started with having sacrifice paddocks um and fed in those sacrifice paddocks they reached the point where, where they were no more viable to lamb into so we then lambed into smaller pens yeah um, 
we'll probably not try and lamb in smaller pens we can but again if we can avoid it um, but if we and learnt that by keeping your U score fat score to that three and a half prior lambing you can probably lamb in a paddock whereas it, if you use lose too much condition you may have to confine them to lamb them but there again if they were in good condition to be confined they would probably have a much, much higher lamb survival rate by having good scores yeah um, where else was I going with the with so we, we gradually reduced our weather mobs down uh, with sort of sheer fat and sheer fat and sheer fat and to and have we've actually the first time we've not had weathers on our weather block in 30 years so yeah. that's sort of is the significance of that drought to us yeah. and, and now we will probably either breed our own back up or re restock our weathers yeah. if, maybe if we can find some so that's yeah. sort of and I think, yeah, the nutrition is one of the key things that we could pick up from that. Like you guys were all over the, that from a from a condition score side of things and, and were aware of how much condition score is influenced by nutrition. And I think a lot of people th during the drought just we became aware about how it is a challenge to manage it quite, you know, so that's a really good point to take from that. Like you just said, everybody learnt a whole lot about animal nutrition out of this drought. Yeah. That's one thing this drought taught people: is yeah. how we can how to feed, and then we learnt how to feed far more efficiently than we yeah. we did previously. I think um, just to add to that, Kate, is the planning and. Um, and having some sort of distraction. I know this is not, uh, but we used to have smokos. And yeah. it might sound really ridiculous, but it was just where we came together. And um, it, we, our son, Thomas, was uh, working with us as well. And we, we would just have downtime, just review, just go, where are we at? And then stick to your plans. So in talking to him, we said, well, what's the takeaway message? Do a plan, stick to your plan and get help, like get other people to information from other people so that you were making those plans with the very best of information you possibly could. Yeah. And, um, and sh you know, it's it's OK. Yeah. 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 I think that summarised it pretty well, Laurie. Like, yeah, one of the things is obviously all the lessons that everyone learnt throughout the drought but the from a from an individual like as as people not not so much the enterprise but as people what, what was important for you guys and that was taking time out so if you could say you know in a couple of words you know both of you what would you say out of this whole thing John <laughs> oh, it was just plan and yeah plan and stick to your plan I think yeah. that was all you can do and yeah. try and I guess our other thing was we we tried to remain with some degree of productivity yeah. it's probably not full productivity but have some pr productivity and have your base so that when it is over you've got something to go on with yeah um, and I guess and fortunately with a cropping enterprise I mean we've missed our crops but we've actually got the ability to put a bit more cropping country in to help get our pasture base back yep. on some of our sacrifice paddocks and things like that, which we haven't spoken about earlier, but that's, yep. yeah, go on. Sorry. And Laurie, what would you say? Just plan. Plan. Plan, talk to people, yeah. Yep. Stay focused. Um, probably have a bit more time out, even if it just means getting in a car and driving up the road for an hour or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah. probably pretty much review. And I, and what this is really good, I find this really valuable to reassess. Yeah. And certainly this sort of case study project, I would have really enjoyed that during um, the dry time, just to go and go, oh, there is a human part yeah. to this whole thing yeah. and people are important. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, so just uh, the planning. We did have weddings as distractions, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was... It's just everybody together and being supported yep. and making those decisions. Yeah, being on the front foot, yep. I think, and and hopefully these case studies will will yeah, help. I if we so. if we have to encounter it again, yep. then something like this will help um, other producers in the region or anywhere with with some of the yeah. decisions they have to make. So thank you for your time. Pleasure. We really thank appreciate you. it, and um, thanks for listening in.